Jeff Levy had some thoughts on Dylan Gabriel. Dylan Gabriel had some thoughts on the Oklahoma Sooners heading into fall camp. We'll touch on that on today's episode of Locked On Sooners. You are Locked On Sooners, your daily podcast on the Oklahoma Sooners. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Sooner Nation? Welcome to Locked On Sooners. Thank you for joining us. My name is John Williams. You can follow me on Twitter at John9Williams. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked On Sooners. And he's Josh Helmer. You can follow him on Twitter at Josh on Ref and listen to him Monday through Friday from 9 to noon on 94.7 The Ref in Norman. Today's episode is brought to you by Built Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online is where the game starts. So, Josh, we talked about Jeff Levy a little bit in our last episode, but we didn't get through everything that we wanted to talk about on what he had to say at OU Media Day. So, we got one more clip we're going to play on Jeff Levy talking about Dylan Gabriel, and we'll talk to you about our thoughts after that. I think the thing that he's done has been exactly who he is. You know, he's been very intentional on creating relationships and making sure that everybody in the locker room knows who he is as a person. And so he's done a great job of that. You know, the thing that we're looking for coming into into fall camp is taking care of the football, you know, operating at a really high level. Those are the two things to me that are, that are most important. The ball's the only thing that matters. So take care of the rock and we're going to be in good shape. So kind of what was the first thing that you took away from Jeff Levy's comments there on Dylan Gabriel? Obviously, it's been a productive offseason if you listen to Coach Jeff Levy on Dylan Gabriel. And I think that was how the question was phrased was what's impressed you with what you've seen from Dylan Gabriel since the spring ended. And what we kind of hear, what we have heard from Marvin Mims, from Eric Gray, you know, a lot of some of his primary skill guys and uh, playmakers on the offensive side of the football is that, Dylan Gabriel's really grabbed the reins of this offense. He's been a teacher. He's been an instructor of this offense in in addition to obviously Jeff Levy himself and Kel Gunny, the rest of this offensive coaching staff. And then uh, the last piece there, John, obviously is really, really important. It's can you take care of the football? I don't think that we've seen those types of problems from Dylan Gabriel in spades in the past, but this is of course a step up into power five football where Maybe things are happening just to just a skosh, just a hair quicker. So we'll see how he handles that. Yeah. So back in his freshman year in 2019, he you know threw for 3,653 yards, 9.2 yards per attempt, threw 29 touchdowns and seven interceptions. In 2020, his yards per attempt dropped off a little bit, but his interception number dropped off too. He threw 32 touchdowns and just four interceptions. Uh, In 2021, through three games, he'd had nine touchdowns, three interceptions um, with a yards per attempt of 8.4, or sorry, eight uh, air yards per attempt was 8.4. So this is a guy that's going to push the ball downfield. Two things you kind of have to reconcile in your brain a little bit when you have a guy that's going to try to get the ball down the field. He's going to take more chances. A lot of times it's going to pay off. Sometimes it's not. This is the, the Brett Favre kind of philosophy, right? When you are looking to get the ball down the field, that means it's higher risk throws, a lot of times into coverage, and you're gonna it's gonna work out more often than not. But every once in a while, it's gonna look like an like a boneheaded interception from the broadcast view. I think that's just par for the course for guys that are kind of gunslingers. I wouldn't necessarily put them in that category, but you know, if you're a guy that's pushing the ball nearly ten yards down the field on average, uh, just in the air, then it, it to me it it screams an aggressive quarterback. You know, your guys that are kind of more of the, I don't even want to use the the, the term game manager or dink and dunker because I feel like it could be, you know, pejorative, like it's, you know, derogatory. But guys that are like looking for the efficient throw, like a Tom Brady or so, like, you know, they're going to get the ball downfield, but they're also going to take, you know, they're, they're going to throw two-yard passes and let their players pick up yards after the catch. They're going to throw the ball behind the line of scrimmage, let guys – pick up yards after the catch Dylan Gabriel. And in this offense, we're going, we're pushing it down the field. We're not going to be throwing a ton of bubble screens. 
we're not throwing a ton of you know stuff behind the line of scrimmage and hoping a wide receiver can make a make a guy miss. We're getting the ball at the we're throwing towards the first down marker, and that's basically what he's doing every time he throws it. It's just going to mean you might throw more interceptions, and I know that that was an issue with Spencer Rattler, and it got him benched. But should it have? Like you got to take chances sometimes, especially when teams are dropping eight into coverage. You got to be willing to like get the ball to the first down marker, and if you know sometimes it's going to work, sometimes it's not. But uh, yeah, that, that was kind of the big thing I took away from that. And I, I think Dylan Gabriel is a guy that is smart with the football, but we're going to see an interception or two. He's not going to be interception less on the season. Well, and expecting as much is just silly. You, you can't expect that even from great quarterbacks. We see that in the national football league from the greatest quarterbacks of all time. Guess what? They get fooled. They get, uh, you know, the coverage, Coverage uh, tricks them a little bit every once in a while, or they just make a bad decision and pass gets deflected, whatever. You know, those guys throw interceptions. It's going to happen. I think the main thing for Dylan Gabriel is what does ultimately that decision-making look like on a regular basis? If it's good, then, John, I think he's got plenty of the tools around him. He's got Marvin Mims, who I think is going to be a Bolitnikoff Award type candidate. I think he's going to finish their final bit of the season absolutely in the mix to potentially win the Bolitnikov. Theo Weiss, I think, is due, John, for a massive, massive breakout year. And then beyond that, you know, Jalil Farouk, is he the guy that steps up? Is it a couple of these true freshmen? Bottom line, Braden Willis at the tight end position, I think, is more than capable of going up and high pointing some balls and boxing, you know, defenders out. I mean, that is a talented tight end that you've got, Braden Willis, that, oh, by the way, has been around some other really, really talented tight ends at Oklahoma. So I think that just in terms of the skill guys that Dylan Gabriel is surrounded by and with, man, he's he's got them in this offense. It's just more about, to me, John, will the decision-making be good? And will this offensive line, are they going to pass protect? Are they going to be really good in that department for him? And uh, how how much is the run game? How far is it going to come along and how quickly? Yeah, there's so much that goes into playing good offense. And it's not just your quarterback's capabilities. It's a lot of different things. I think the thing that's going to benefit Dylan Gabriel is that this is going to be an offense that's predicated on getting the ball out of his hands early. And that's going to not only help him, but the offensive line. They're not having to pass protect for three, four, five seconds at a time. If the ball is scheduled to come out two and a half seconds on a slant or shorter or get the ball downfield and he's not holding on to it to allow his guy to get downfield, I mean, this is going to it's gonna work well. And I think the short area passing game is where this is. there's going to be a better difference in what we saw last year and this year. Lincoln Riley just never really seemed um, content with the short area passing game. He wanted the big plays which had become so prevalent during the Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, Jalen Hurts era. But we kind of lived and died with them in you know, the Spencer Rattler, Caleb Williams couple seasons. Sometimes it was great. Teams that decided, hey, we're going to play coverage against you. It didn't work out. But I think there's enough in Jeff Levy's offense that's going to allow them to kind of attack teams in the short area part of the field if they're trying to play eight, you know, eight deep in coverage. They can just attack in the five-yard, six-yard slants, the short outs and soften them up a little bit and then take their shots down the field you know make teams pay for playing coverage with the run game as you mentioned like if you're going to drop eight in the box they should be able to gash teams like or not eight in the box but eight into coverage they should be able to gash teams and then once that starts happening teams are going to start you know pulling guys back up into the box you got to play more man-to-man so that you can account for the running game and that's going to be a you know, Marvin Mims' opportunity to win some one-on-one battles and Theo Weiss's opportunity as well. And I think that's where Oklahoma is going to really thrive is those two guys on the outside. I think they complement each other really, really well. They're not the same type of wide receiver. They can both get down the field. They can both make big plays. They just do it a little bit differently. And and I'm excited, man. You know, Theo Weiss is probably the guy I'm most excited to see back on the field come September 3. I think that's going to be a huge just kind of re-addition to the, to the program. The guy's got his head right. He's a guy that can make plays in the short area and you know create yards after after the catch. For as much as we enjoyed Jaden Hazelwood and how as good as he was, he didn't really do much after the catch. Theo Weiss, though, he's a guy that can make a guy miss after you know an eight yard curl and you know make another guy miss and make it a big play. So it's going to be really really exciting. 
So we got more from Dylan Gabriel that we'll talk about. But first, I want to talk to you about Bet Online. It's the fastest and the easiest way to check in on all your betting needs and find all the latest sports and events at betonline.net. Find reviews and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, college football, combat sports, esports, and even golf. You can get in on NCAA futures. You want to bet on Oklahoma's chances to win the Big 12 championship? You can get in on that at betonline.net. So head to BetOnline today to or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening. BetOnline is where the game starts. And thank you so much for making Locked On Sooners your first listen every single day. We're free and available on all podcast platforms. And Josh, we got you know quite a bit from Dylan Gabriel that we could touch on. Um, but let's hear kind of the, the thing that was the big kind of question – you know, coming through the transfer portal, following Caleb Williams. Let's hear what Gabriel had to say about some of this. It's crazy. And I think, you know, God works in mysterious ways. But, you know, I just I'm, I'm so thankful I am here. Thankful I'm around great people. Um, grateful to be in a spot that's just a positive influence on me. And I have a lot of great role models to look at. Right. And I think when you put all that together and have guys in the locker room that push you to be your best, I mean, there's a, it's a it's a recipe for success, you know. So or excellence, like Coach always says. So I, I'm just I'm just living proof that you know when you got the great guys around you and people that pour into you, man, like good things can happen. So yeah. So you know the, you know the story by now. Caleb Williams enters the transfer portal. Dylan Gabriel just a few hours after commits to Oklahoma. I mean, at one point he was even considering Ole Miss when Jeff Levy was still there. Jeff Levy went to OU kind of threw some things up in the air and he just and he talked about it you know the mysterious ways that the that god works and um you know i think it was i think it's intriguing just how much this guy fits with brent venables just the the attitude the the team first kind of dynamic i mean you saw in some of the social media stuff that he's put out there with the dime time retreat with his pass catchers the time he spent with the offensive line it, he just seems like a down-to-earth guy very team-centered I don't want this to seem like I don't think Dylan Gabriel can be a professional quarterback because I wholeheartedly believe Dylan Gabriel can be a professional quarterback and can wind up being a really good NFL quarterback before it's all said and done. But I think in some ways Dylan Gabriel is the perfect quarterback at the right time for Oklahoma, given that he he doesn't have that Spencer Rattler, Caleb Williams portfolio attached to him he wasn't the five-star kid coming out of high school he does have a little bit of the quote-unquote chip on the shoulder I need to prove something and he's a proven college quarterback at this point in time in his career but I just think in terms of starting out this era of Oklahoma football what it's going to look like hard-nosed hard worker what this program's trying to prove on a national stage from a national perspective I think it's kind of a perfect marriage. Now we'll see whether or not I'm singing the same tune here in six, seven months. But look, like I said off the top, I think that Dylan Gabriel absolutely is going to wind up being a professional quarterback. I think he's going to finish this season as a Heisman hopeful, Heisman front runner type quarterback. And I think he's going to win the Big 12 quarterback of the year. But again, Dylan Gabriel does not have that five-star label attached to him. And I think that ultimately that can be a positive change for Oklahoma in year one of Brent Venables. You know, we always heard about, you know, what they say up at Iowa state about Matt Campbell's recruits, you know, they might be three-star players, but they got a five-star mentality. I think there's something to that. you know, like you can have like all the talent, all the capabilities, but then mentally just, or personally, or like just the way you carry yourself, may not match that you know what i mean and i think like what we're getting out of dylan gabriel is kind of this three-star quarterback which is what he was coming out of high school but he's got a five-star mentality and i think that's we're going to see that a lot out of of oklahoma like you're going to have five stars with five-star mentalities you know four stars like guys that mentally they're able to hold up to the rigors and the stress and the kind of the limelight without it getting you know making them so big, like in, the, in their own mind. You know what I mean? Like Schmidt is going to keep them humble. Brent Venable is going to keep them humble. Those whole, all those coaches are going to keep them pretty humble. Like one of the things I took away from, you know, the, the coach, the assistant coach's uh, session 
um, at media day was these are intense dudes. Like they're like, you listen to Miguel Chavis and you like, he's intense. Like you're, you're going to play your very, very best for him. Cause if you don't like, he's going to give it to you and he's going to let you know, you know, I think the same for DeMarco Murray is a different kind of intense. He's, I feel like he's a softer intense, but you know, it's like that, you know, that intensity that's kind of like, he doesn't have to say it, but you just see it on his face. Cause he's just, I don't know. He's just locked in. And so I think like you, you mentioned like Dylan Gabriel just being a perfect fit for where Oklahoma is now, man, I think that hits perfectly, you know, and somebody, you know, they've brought up the, the Josh Heupel comparisons at times. And I, and I think there's something to say, you know, to be said for at least the mentality aspect of it, who knows if they're going to have the same, if he's going to have the same level of success, but just the mentality of it, you know, guy with that, that has had some success at the college level coming into a big time program, with a chip on his shoulder at a program that kind of has a chip on his shoulder at the same time, you know, like Bob Stoops took over in 99, they went seven and five, but they're still coming off the heels of like some terrible years of football to Oklahoma standards, you know, and now Brent Venables takes over a much better situation having just gone 11 and two, win a bowl game, had a pretty good recruiting class in 2022 but still, Oklahoma as a program still has a bit of a chip on its shoulder because of everything that kind of the national media has been trying to say about Oklahoma for eight, nine months. Um, that it's slowly kind of, they're slowly like making that narrative go away and it's deteriorating. Um, but yeah, this is a team, I think collectively, that's got a chip on its shoulder. And, and I think that's a good thing. And I, I kind of feel bad for UTEP when they roll into Owen Field on, on September 3rd because this team is going to be fired up and ready to, to, uh, to to get violent as Miguel Chavis likes to say. Yeah, I have no sympathy for UTEP, but uh I do wish them well after uh obviously the season opener versus Oklahoma. To uh what you were talking about right there, I do think physically there's some similarities between a Dylan Gabriel and a Baker Mayfield. I do think the the path in terms of kind of you know obviously Dylan Gabriel's not a juco kid but being a little less heralded i think there's some similarities there to a josh heupel and you kind of look at the puzzle pieces of all three of those quarterbacks let's see if there's any similarities in terms of how it ultimately plays out but you kind of found oklahoma at crossroads at each particular juncture when those three respective quarterbacks took over for oklahoma josh heupel obviously you're coming out of the decade of disaster for Oklahoma entering the beginning of the Bob Stoops era. Okay, Baker Mayfield, people forget, but things weren't looking all that great after the 2014 season in Norman, Oklahoma. There was doom. There was despair. Baker Mayfield was what turned that thing back around and turned Oklahoma into a regular college football playoff participant. And now here you have, obviously, Dylan Gabriel taking over, John, and it's an Oklahoma program that really, I mean, for the first time in its history – for the first time in a long time in its history, has a head coach willingly choose to leave and go to a different college job? Like, okay, that doesn't happen at OU. So all of these quarterbacks have taken over at these important crossroads for Oklahoma football. And there's kind of some intriguing similarities between those three quarterbacks. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, there's there's reason we can make these comparisons because it just feels similar. It feels the same. Um, at those different times. Now, I wasn't a fan back in 99 when uh, Bob Stoops took over and, and in 2000 during the national championship year, but I very much remember what it was like at the end of the Bob or the, you know, not the Bob Stoops era, but yeah, two, 2014 after the Russell Athletic Bowl, getting trounced by Clemson, the, you know, the move away from Josh Heupel, bringing in Lincoln Riley, and still like kind of some uncertainty. Like, yes, Baker Mayfield's coming, but I mean, what did we really know about Baker Mayfield aside from a few games that he played at Tech? Like, there was some intrigue and excitement, but you still had to kind of see it on the field a little bit. And I, and I think there's still some, in, there's excitement, there's intrigue about what Dylan Gabriel is going to bring to the Oklahoma Sooners. But I think everybody's still kind of like sitting on pins and needles a little bit until we see it on the field. I mean, we've had such great quarterback play for much of the last five, six, seven years. I won't say that there's uncertainty about Gabriel, but it's just like, okay, now what do we have? Like, who is this guy? Because I think everybody was very confident at least in year two of Baker. They were pretty confident in Kyler Murray, very confident in Jalen Hurts, at least I was. And then with the five-star quarterbacks coming, you thought, okay, these guys are going to be great. 
and they were just kind of they're a little underwhelming like they didn't live up to the billing except in moments and now dylan gabriel comes and i think it's like okay let's see what we've got we're excited but I'm still a little bit hesitant and that's okay. Like that's not a bad place to be. I think, I think there's a lot about this team that we can be very, very excited about, but we still have a lot of things we want to see on the field before we are ready to say, yes, they are, they're it. They're ready to roll. We've got all the questions answered and this is going to be a team that's going to be great. I mean, I think we still got some questions, but I mean, there's, that's a whole another time for a whole another show that we'll talk through at some point uh, as the, Fall camp goes along and we get ready for the 2022 college football season. We got one more clip from Dylan Gabriel that we'll talk about next, but that's going to be after Josh talks to us about home field apparel. Ah, Thank you very much. Our friends at homefieldapparel.com. You can see right there hanging over the right shoulder of our friend, John Williams, some of our home field apparel, uh, Oklahoma merch. They've got 15 different pieces of apparel, T-shirts, hoodies, crew necks. They've all got that. And look at that. John's even sporting one right there, the Sooner Magic tee. So check them out, homefieldapparel.com. Use our code, uh, any of the new customers out there. You'll get 15% off your first purchase at Homefield with our code, Locked On Sooners at checkout. That is Locked On Sooners at checkout over at homefieldapparel.com. I did really kind of dig what Dylan Gabriel had to say about himself and his teammates. And basically, John, he was asked, hey, what type of excitement do you have for this offense? How good can this offense be in 2022? I'm super excited. Um, I think every guy on our team, at least on our offense, bring a unique skill set, speed, size, athleticism, you know, you know, agile, shifty, you know, whatever you, you want to say. I think we check all the boxes where we want to be. Um, we want to be the aggressors. We want to set the tempo of the game. And having those guys, it helps. You know, of course, you know, big boys up front. So whenever you got those guys, you know, leading the, the charge and then a bunch of skilled players that can really make plays, I think you just you set yourself up for success. And, you know, we'll let our action do the talking. But, I mean, the excitement's real. People say, it, you know, they're excited, but I'm truly excited because there's just a bunch that we can do and in, in every position. So that's what I'm excited about. A deep group of skill players, guys that can make plays, and an offensive line that he's really, really excited about. And, and, I, and I think probably what everybody's excited about is just this attitude of we're ready to go show it. Well, and what we've talked about with him being the, the right quarterback at the right time I do think for him, and I've, I've mentioned this, John, this is going to sound like a broken record for you, but I've said this a lot throughout the course of this offseason. I just think there's such an excitement for Dylan Gabriel and such an appreciation to be the starting quarterback at the University of Oklahoma. And listening to him there, it just reinforces that thought and that belief that I have about Dylan Gabriel taking over as a starting quarterback at the University of Oklahoma. I mean, he's got to be walking around – in the, the locker room, around the facility, out to the practice field, you name it with the University of Oklahoma and his teammates and just looking around going, okay, yeah, this is Power 5 football. This is Oklahoma football. This is uh, play like a champion today football. Look at these skill guys I have around me. Look at these offensive linemen that I have around me. Look at this coaching staff. I'm back with my boy. I'm back with Jeff Levy here at the University of Oklahoma. And oh my goodness, there there goes DeMarco Murray and there's Kale Gundy and there's Coach Beatonball. I mean, he's just got to be just chomping at the bit to get started because of all of the pieces of the puzzle that are around him, John, that simply have not been at his disposal to this point in his collegiate career. Yeah, and when we talk about the step up in competition, we also got to talk about the step up in talent that he's going to get to play with. Sorry, UCF fans. I know I've offended you in the past with comments such as these, but he's getting to play with better players. That's just the reality of it. And he's going to have a really good offensive line playing in front of him. We know four of the five starters that who are going to be playing. Still got to work out that right tackle spot. But, I mean, he's right. The, the skill position group is diverse. It's talented. I mean, you have – you could go with three wide receivers like Marvin Mims, Theo Wees, and Drake Stoops as your slot guy. You could decide you want to throw Jaden Gibson out there, and that brings you a tall slot guy, like a big slot, like a Michael Thomas type. 
you could decide you want to go four wide and have you know four guys that are over six feet tall, six foot three out there on the field together. Uh, you got a couple tight ends in Daniel Parker and Braden Willis, who are both really, really good blockers and also can catch passes as well, creating just a lot of diversity, a lot of multiplicity for your offense a little bit. And then we've talked about the running backs a lot in the last couple of weeks, but I mean, a very diverse group of running backs as well. So it's it's very intriguing and, and it is exciting. And I think I'm excited. I'm excited to see what this product is going to look like once they get on the field, because there's there's so much potential in this group. And there's so much, um, there's so many options for how Jeff Levy can run this offense and how these coaches can rotate their guys in and out. Because I mean, we saw in the spring game, like a guy like Jaden Gibson, you know, a 90 plus yard touchdown reception. That doesn't happen by accident. You got to have the skills for that. Uh, and when we saw with, with Eric Gray, the big play in the running game, we've seen it with Marcus major. We've seen, you know, Braden Willis, you know, the Oklahoma state catch, where he goes up over two guys and makes a big play. I mean, it's a really, really intriguing group. And it's, we talked about in the last segment, a group that's going to have a bit of a chip on their shoulder because they don't necessarily have a ton of big names on their team. They don't have the Jordan Addisons, the Xavier Worthy, the Bijan Robinson, the Jackson Smith and Jigba. You know, they don't have those kind of guys, but they got, a, they got some good players. They've got some really talented players kind of similar to like the no-name defense of the Philadelphia Eagles back in like the 70s, 80s. But this is going to be a team. They don't have a lot of names. By the end of the season, a lot of people are going to know a lot of the names on this team. Right. I mean, they might – look, Marvin Mims is a name, right? I mean, he's going to be, you know, I think no worse than a second-round NFL draft pick. Theo Weiss, we'll see. This is a – I'm basically labeling it, John, a contract year. For Theo Weiss, I know that maybe that's an uncomfortable phrasing to use uh, for some folks out there in terms of, you know, saying that about a college kid and a college athlete, though, uh, name, image, and likeness has blurred those lines a little bit. Maybe it's a little little bit more comfortable to say that. But it is a contract year for Theo Weiss. He's got a chance to really make himself some money and show, hey, I'm back, I'm healthy, I'm a superstar type talent. And that's there. That's, That's a possibility for Oklahoma. And then beyond that, you've got some other skill guys, John, that I think they've got other NFL guys to be that are in the skill department, but you're right. Okay. Do they have a top 15 guy like Jackson Smith in Jigba? Do they have Travion Henderson in their backfield? No, they don't have those guys. And yet the collective sum of everything that Oklahoma has got going on offensively and defensively, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think we've got a chance here with this team, with this coaching staff, they're certainly capable. The schedule is in place the right way, John, for them to go on the type of run where by season's end we're saying, you know what, that's one of the best Oklahoma football teams we've seen in, in quite some time. And I loved what Dylan Gabriel said there. Basically, we're going to show you, right? I'm not going to sit up here and have a bunch of flowery quotes and this and that and speak in hyperbole about how great we are. There's a quiet confidence about what he believes in himself and his teammates. It's not, and this is a Oklahoma defense of yesteryear, but there's no, hey, we're the we're the Sharks and look out for us on this documentary going on with uh, this Oklahoma team. It's just, you know, you're going to see. We're pretty good, and I like that. And I'm sure I can speak for all of Sooner Nation when I say September 3rd can't get here fast enough. I mean, we're less than a month away. I hope you're excited. Hope you have your home field apparel ready for week one of the season and the rest of college football season. So go to homefieldapparel.com. Hey, and that's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Sooners. Make sure you check out the show wherever you get your podcasts. We're free and available on all platforms. Go to YouTube, subscribe to the show over there. Hit the notification bell to let you know when new episodes drop and drop a comment. Let us know how you're feeling about the Oklahoma Sooners heading into 2022. But until next time, he's Josh Helmer. I'm John Williams. We'll catch you then. Boomer Sooner.